Hi everyone, thanks for coming down today. My name is Rich Ashby, I'm the founder of a company called Dotkumo and today's talk is let's talk about voice. So just to give you a bit of background about Dotkumo, uh, it was started in uh, February 2017. Uh, I have over 20 years experience in web content and social media and some of the services Dotkumo offer include social media content, strategy, paid advertising, social media training and campaign management. Uh, I also offer uh, video editing and motion graphics as well, along with chatbots and what we're going to be talking about today, which is voice technology. So enough of the sales pitch, let's have a look at what we'll cover in today's session. So first of all, what is voice technology? Um, then we'll move on to how this technology actually works. Possibly the most crucial aspect is why we should be using it. And then who's using it well? Um, some best practice in voice design and finish off with some practical demonstrations. So in terms of what is voice technology, well all the big tech giants and the large players are investing heavily in voice in 2018. So these range from the Amazon Alexa through to Google Home, Microsoft with their Cortana system, Apple with Siri, and Siri is probably one of the oldest voice assistants out there, and uh, Samsung Bixby. So let's have a look at some of the devices um, that are available out there. So Amazon, uh, they have the uh, hockey puck shaped uh, Echo Dot device, uh, which is the entry level device. Um, very, very cheap to buy, but works very well. Uh, then you've got the Amazon uh, Echo, which is a slightly larger speaker, slightly better sound quality. Then more recently, the Echo Spot, which looks a bit like a uh, fancy clock radio, but uh, interestingly allows for imagery and text to be displayed uh, when running uh, Alexa skills. And also then you've got the uh, uh, Echo Show, which uh, has video capability as well, um, and a much larger higher res screen. At the cheaper end of the market, you've got the uh, Amazon Fire Stick, which when you plug it into a television or monitor, it's a USB device, that gives uh, Alexa functionality. Most recently in the States, they launched the uh, um, Fire Cube, um, which uh, actually works as a set-up box, which allows things like 4K streaming of Netflix and other content providers, and gives uh, Alexa functionality. And then finally, uh, various smart TVs, set-up boxes have been uh, built with Alexa technology, um, also appliances as well, and uh, also right through to um, automobiles as well. So uh, the Ford Motor Company are including some of the uh, technology in some of their models. Likewise, Google have a similar lineup of devices. They've got a donut-shaped uh, Google Home mini speaker and a larger Google Home speaker, uh, with, again, slightly better sound quality. They also have the uh, Assistant app, which is available for iOS and Android, and that allows for uh, Google Actions to be uh, available across a much wider range of devices. Microsoft support Cortana on Windows 7, so that's desktop and laptops. Uh, obviously, they support uh, support it across um, the Surface device, and uh, mo more recently, uh, their range of consoles, including the uh, Xbox One X. And then Apple, obviously, uh, their entire range now includes Siri support, so right, right through from every flavor of the iPhone, including the iPhone X, uh, iPads, uh, the MacBook range, right through to iMacs and the iMac Pro, uh, and more recently, their, their first foray into the uh, smart speaker system, which is the HomePod. And then finally, Samsung Bixby, so we've got the various different devices, the Galaxy 9, uh, the Note, um, through to their tablet devices, and also their TVs and their other um, devices as well. So, in order to be able to get a better understanding of uh, voice technology, it's useful to see um, really a bit more about history. So, as you're probably aware, Alan Turing was a pioneer of modern computing. And he was part of a team at Bletchley Park in World War II who successfully decoded the Enigma device. And this um, significantly shortened the war effort and ultimately uh, potentially led to millions of lives being saved. So following the uh, success of this project, Turing devised the Turing test in 1950. And the principle of the test was for a machine to exhibit behaviour equivalent to or indistinguishable from a human. And this has been the goal of uh, artificial intelligence researchers and academics for years. And uh, following the uh, introduction of the test, uh, this generated a huge amount of interest in the academic community, and it still does to this day. 
And in the very early 1960s, uh, Professor Marvin Minsky, who was based at the uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, started a very influential uh, project, the AI Laboratory. And uh, the aim of this group was to explore artificial intelligence, machine learning, and natural language processing. And uh, I love this quote from uh, Minsky that was actually made in 1970, but it's incredibly perceptive and it really describes um, the kind of development of AI and also development of voice technology. So just to read that to you, uh, computer languages of the future will be more concerned with goals and less with procedures specified by the programmer. And I think what Minsky means here is uh, up until that date and uh, even to the present day, uh, computer programming tends to be very analytical, it runs along pretty, uh, pretty fine routes, it's procedural, you follow a process, um, and that's absolutely fine. But it's been quite difficult sometimes for users to interact with that. They had to learn a set of tools or a language or a specific way of working, whether that's an operating system or gestures or what have you. But as AI has developed, computers have been able to make more decisions for themselves based on parameters, variables and algorithms. And it also makes it easier for us to interact with them as well because they'll be able to understand context, they'll be able to understand different commands. And so it won't, we won't need to necessarily learn a whole set of procedures to deal with a computer, it will be much more flexible. So that's a really interesting quote and it kind of, it really encapsulates a lot of the uh, things we're going to be talking about shortly. Um, and another project that emerged from the AI lab was ELISA in 1964. And essentially, this was a very early chatbot where um, individuals had a conversation with a computer. Uh, the interesting thing with Eliza is in people taking part in the experiment weren't told they were talking to a machine. So if you imagine for a moment, um, you're on the MIT campus, 1964, um, you log on to a computer terminal, and the person uh, actually making... Um, uh, input into the uh, question, do you think somebody at the other end having a conversation with you? And that wasn't actually the case. You were talking to a machine. Um, but in Eliza simulated conversations in a fairly, uh, what is now a fairly primitive way, but then it was fairly groundbreaking. And it used techniques such as pattern matching, the substitution methodology. But the crucial thing is Eliza could simulate a conversation, but it couldn't understand the context of the words being said. Um, having said that, it did run uh, multiple scripts, and one of the most popular was one called Doctor, and that simulated a uh, psychotherapist. So uh, essentially, you could have a conversation, it could ask you how you about your childhood, how you felt about your mother, uh, if you suffered from anxiety and things like that, and it really get, got a feel that you were talking to uh, a medical professional who could help you. And interestingly, you can still look at Eliza, there's still an archive of it, you can still, if you just Google Eliza, uh, you will find various working versions, so you can actually try these out and, uh, and try it for yourself. Um, and Eliza attempted a Turing test, and needless to say, it failed uh, for the reasons I outlined earlier. It was, uh, it was too primitive, um, and it couldn't understand the context. So if we move forward um, to the present day uh, and bring things back up to date, Artificial intelligence, natural language processing and technology have made huge leaps forward and can now start to understand context. Um, crucially, the Turing test has still not been passed, but we are getting much closer. Um, and this brings me on to Google Duplex. And they recently demonstrated their technology that links voice technology to cloud services such as Google Calendar. And it uses a fairly sophisticated piece of AI with a dense net uh, using Google's TensorFlow. And this enables complex interactions and, um, to, be, uh, to take place and also crucially understands context in a limited sense. So to give you an example, let's say that we wanted to make a booking for a hair appointment between uh, 10 and 12 o'clock on a specific day. Um, we were too busy, we were stacked out with meetings, there was too much going on. What we could do potentially is delegate that um, to a machine. The machine would then uh, use um, voice synthesis to basically speak to uh, a human at the other end and then they would check through the uh, different parameters of our appointment book and our Google Calendar and make the relevant appointment. So here's a quick example from uh, of Google Duplex in action. Mm -hmm. Sure, what time are you looking for around? At 12 p.m. 
We do not have a 12 p.m. available. The closest we have to that is a 115. Do you have anything between 10 a.m. and uh, 12 p.m.? Depending on what service she would like, what service is she looking for? Just a woman's haircut for now. Okay, we have a 10 o'clock. 10 a.m. is fine. Okay, what's her first name? The first name is Lisa. Okay, perfect. So I will see Lisa at 10 o'clock on May 3rd. Okay, great. Thanks, great. Have a great day. Bye. So we can uh, observe a fairly natural conversation. Uh, it even included um, various pauses and mm's just to make the uh, computer uh, sound more human. Now this diagram on first sight looks fairly complicated, but uh, this will actually break down the process of what's actually happening here. So um, effectively what begins with um, the sine wave at the top left um, is the uh, speech from the human operator at the hair salon being translated using automatic speech recognition software. Um, and then contexts are established so the different pathways in the dense net can then look at the information so it can understand the context of the time, it can understand the day, it can understand various different inputs and variables that are being, coming backwards and forwards and that really creates that conversation. Then obviously there's things like small talk which have been added just to make the experience more human. Then finally you've got a text-to-speech synthesis, this all happens in a fraction of a second and then it's output. So it becomes a fairly natural conversation um, and um, so, so natural in fact that um, there's been legislation brought in in the States that when this system launches uh, people will actually need to be told at the start of a the conversation they were talking to a machine so people aren't lulled into uh, any kind of... Uh, false sense of security. Um, so duplex is said to currently be effective in about 80% of situations, so it doesn't yet pass the Turing test. But the deep learning expert uh, Andrew Ne at Google predicts that once speech recognition is 99% accurate, voice will be the primary way we interact with computers. Um, so estimates suggest they're at around about 95% currently, but the final 4% is really challenging. So we've looked a bit about the history of AI, the history um, of uh, voice technology, and also the future of voice technology. So now let's have a look at some ways that we might use smart speakers. So those are the uh, Amazon Alexa devices, the Google Home devices, HomePods, and things like that. So home, home, home automation is a really good one uh, and uh, frequently used. So that might be as simple as turning on your lights, um, adjusting your thermostat, setting routines. So for instance, when you open the door, various things are ready. It might have your um, TV switched on, things like that, ready, for, ready to go. Uh, and all of the devices support that. Um, timers and alarms fairly basic. Yes, it's possible to do these kind of things on a mobile phone, but there's a greater level of sophistication available. Um, Alexa offers routines. Google Home have very similar things as well, and uh, also um, Apple uh, extending their, their Siri range in iOS 12 to include a, a much greater, much more sophisticated range of timers and alarms. Uh, commerce. This is a really critical one, particularly for the Alexa. Um, it enables frictionless purchase of goods and services. You've got a constant um, connection to a, uh, to a retail outlet. You can uh, very, very easily make purchases. You can uh, restock things. And it's very, very easy and, and simple to be able to make purchases and, uh, in a very intuitive way rather than having to go to a website and, uh, and click. You can just literally just use your voice to order things. Schedule in. Um, really, really helpful. We all tend to keep lists. We all tend to uh, try and keep tabs of our calendar and diary and know what's happening. But being able to do that in a uh, in a verbal way is much more intuitive sometimes than having to actually physically write things down or and forget them and lose the post-it note. So again, that's a really helpful one. Health and fitness. Um, there's been a boom in health and fitness uh, skills available for Alexa actions on uh, Google Home. And these range from, uh, it might be diet advice, it might be uh, helping us to keep motivated. It might be uh, things like mindfulness, and meditation, uh, helping us with that and yoga. So uh, that's a real huge growth industry as well for, for voice technology. And then music and podcasts. So obviously the speakers, so music plays a big role. Uh, podcasts, the popularity of those is, uh, is huge. And again, um, it really uh, helps aid the discoverability of podcast content by using these devices. Um, news and updates, flash briefings on the Alexa, 
and uh, various other services on Google Home allow uh, news providers and indeed anyone to uh, to uh, give uh, frequent daily or weekly updates. Um, it's as simple, it really is just attaching a, a news feed from your site, pulling that in uh, and being able to give people uh, constant updates to that information. Um, so we've mentioned about the skills and, and actions, so let's take a look at these in a bit more detail. Well, both the Alexa and the Google Home um, can add new functionality. So this tends to be called skills in Alexa and actions in Google. And these give the devices new capabilities. And crucially, they're open platforms, so anyone can build for them, which is, uh, which is really helpful. Um, it's fairly quick and simple to create content for these devices and there's a lot of uh, resources and help out there. And there's currently over 40,000 Alexa skills available with a very active developer community. Um, likewise, Google has started to build this community as well. Um, they are making big strides as well in this area. So um, there's a really vibrant and, uh, and helpful and friendly community out there. So here's a quick example of um, the uh, Alexa Skills Store. Um, think of it a little bit like the, the App Store that you might see. Um, things are arranged into categories. You can do searches. You can look for skills that may be relevant. So obviously the World Cup's um, currently on at the moment. Um, so there's lots of football skills, for football results, uh, football commentary, uh, punditry, things like that. So um, again, who, you know, things like who's going to win um, the, the World Cup, so that's quite useful. Likewise, Google have the assistant directory. Um, content is very uh, clearly arranged again into categories and you've got the, uh, you know, the search options that you would expect from Google as well. Um, so we've had a look at some of the ways people uh, are currently using them. Let's have a look at some of the ways that they could be using them in the future. And obviously business and commerce is a huge market. Um, and Alexa in particular, Amazon, they're really sort of caught in this at the moment. Um, so to give you a few kind of examples, well, customer service is a terrific one. Um, you probably can't afford to have a call centre working 24-7, but being able to speak to a device that can give basic information or basic updates about your products and services is really helpful. Likewise, if you're in a large presentation or a team meeting and you need an access to figures quickly, you probably won't want to have to log into your phone, go into your email account, look for the attachment, realise that you deleted it, panic, and uh, you know mess things up. So instead, you could just say, Alexa, give me the figures, the sales figures for February 2012, and it's a much more intuitive way. Again, those can be read out aloud to the rest of the group. Uh, marketing channel, this is a really interesting one, and the more progressive and forward-thinking companies are already seeing voice as part of their marketing mix. So they may already have the website, they might have a CRM behind it underpinning things, they will probably have email marketing, uh, things like MailChimp, and they'll have the social media channels as well, and probably some print collateral to go with it. And voice is another way of marketing your brand and, and giving the personality of your brand and allowing people to interact with it and get a, a better feeling of what you're about. So we're starting to see this, a lot of film companies are using it, um, a lot of lifestyle type companies are also starting to embrace it and, and you'll see that kind of from the large kind of um, corporates, so your Sonys and your Netflixes, right through to probably small businesses, small innovative startups trying to start to, uh, to use this as a channel. Uh, retail, there's lots of reports at the moment of, uh, of retail uh, in the doldrums and footfall being down and, and stores having to close and, and reduce numbers. Um, and um, obviously this is a, this is a, a gradual decline. Um, but one, one way uh, that might be helpful would be to have uh, voice activated devices in shops. So again, you could ask what products are new, um, be able to get information about specific things if things are in stock. Uh, it makes it much more intuitive, particularly where you've got the uh, devices with visuals such as the Echo Show. You could show products and services that are available. Um, virtual concierge. Um, there are hotel chains at the moment in the US experimenting with this, including uh, Hilton uh, and also some Airbnb apartments as well. And it could basically allow things like fast check-in. You could um, find out more about um, your room, find out more about what's available. Let's say you were hungry, you just got off a flight and you want to find out which restaurants are in the local area or how would I book a taxi and things like that. A virtual concierge using voice technology is a really good way of dealing with that. Uh, museums and galleries, um, again, great to have a device like that in the foyer. You could say, what's on floor seven today? Is it Matisse? Is it Monet? Get a better understanding of the things that are out there and also uh, 
be able to, um, to to find out more about what's in there. Entertainment. Um, some of the uh, larger entertainment companies, um, such as Netflix and the BBC, are doing really innovative things at the moment, where they're taking uh, shows such as Doctor Who, Stranger Things, Lost in Space, and they're basically uh, creating content uh, and interactive narratives where you'll actually speak to the device and you can interact, you can have a conversation with the characters, and so you can get further actually into the uh, into the action, into uh, into the drama itself. Uh, content curation, this is kind of, uh, again, fairly in its infancy, but um, definitely an interesting development. And a good example of this might be um, for a record label, if they had new releases, you could use the audio capabilities of devices to play a 30-second sample of that week's releases. Or it might be uh, a museum or a gallery, again, uh, offering uh, tasters into to what's available. So being able to cur curate content, give people a, a, a fun and interactive experience that they can engage with, and that will hopefully uh, lead to more sales or to more people visiting uh, museums and galleries. Um, supporting the elderly, this is a very, very uh, good use of the technology. Um, and some local councils in the UK are actually experimenting with this at the moment. So uh, with some old people, they, they may not be uh, comfortable using computers. They may uh, have trouble with a tablet uh, for various different reasons, or they might have issues with uh, mobile phones. So being able to speak to, uh, to a device to say, find out when their carers are due in or find out when the bins are being emptied and things like that can be really helpful. Likewise, it can also help um, with safety as well. So devices can be alerted if somebody was to fall over or have any kind of accidents in that way. Um, and also companionship as well. So being able to, uh, so people, even though they're talking to a machine, that they feel that they are not alone and help is available at, at any time. The emergency crews. Um, in the US there's been trials um, of um, people in, uh, in, in ER crews, ambulance crews, uh, using voice technology so they can keep their hands free to deal with casualties, but actually get information about, let's say, which hospital is the nearest one, which is open, uh, if it was a disaster area. Uh, casualty figures and things like that. Uh, also, police forces and law enforcement in the US have started to use it as well as a way of actually um, collecting notes and uh, from cases, so it frees them up um, from less paperwork, but obviously keeps a record of that as well. Uh, and intriguingly, uh, it's also recently been used in surgery. So Boston's Children's Hospital uh, in the States, their gastroenterology department have started using Alexa-powered cameras so during surgery, they can say, Alexa, show me camera two or show me a close-up of this. And again, it's a much more intuitive way so the surgeons and the surgical team can actually get involved in, the, uh, in what they need to do and focus on that. And, and obviously, uh, then they can, can use the, the voice technology to help them be uh, more efficient. Um, so we've looked at some of the use cases. Now let's have a, a look at a bit under the hood now and see how the voice technology that we use works. So, as I mentioned before, it uses natural language processing to help understand and interpret voice commands. And this is underpinned by some fairly um, sophisticated machine learning techniques um, that are available. Um, so this is an example. This is um, pretty much the same process for Amazon Alexa and Google Home. Uh, and there's various different stages. So what happens is the device is in passive listening mode. It's listening for what's called an invocation. Now that sounds slightly magical, a bit like a spell, but an invocation is essentially a word, sometimes called a wake word, that actually triggers um, the uh, device to respond. So the user gives the wake word, and that may be something like um, Alexa Open Coffee Wizard, that can be the title of the actual skill itself. Um, then the device returns the welcome message. This is typically hello, how are you, uh, or this is a uh, this is a skill, and it will give usually a, give a set of options or choices or some guidance, um, and these are called intents. And then the user gives an intent. We'll cover this in a bit more detail in a second. And then depending if if the device can understand the user's uh, response to the intent, it will then return a response. So intents. Well, intents are used to trigger a response. So an example might be a skill or action could ask you where you want to go on holiday. It might be New York, Paris or Tokyo. And each of these choices would be a separate intent and produce different responses. Um, another interesting thing you can do with intents is you can include synonyms. And these are really powerful. Um, so if users have a different name for something, this can be handled in a graceful way. So for instance, uh, in the UK, we would call something a pavement. 
uh, Americans would call it a sidewalk. So being able to have different synonyms, different ways that we say things can be really helpful because then the device can understand the intent and it can still respond in a, in a meaningful way. Uh, AI is actually used with natural language processing, so phrases don't always have to be exact as well, which is helpful. So there is some margin of error and a bit of leeway, which again can be very useful. Um, slots. You can also add slots to intent, and these request data uh, be captured in a set order. Um, think of these a bit like mandatory fields on a phone, but in a slightly friendlier way. Um, and this is particularly useful for retail or e-commerce, so if you're booking a holiday. So a slot example, one example might be uh, a location. So you can have a, a slot might be a city. Then you might also have a mode of transport. And then you might also have one slot might be a, a, a time. Um, so for instance, if somebody uh, was um, arriving on a flight from New York uh, and they were arriving um, you know, by a taxi and then the time was 12 o'clock, you could get all of this data, get this asked by the, uh, the skill or the action itself, capture that data so it's really helpful. So if for instance you were a hotel um, picking up people, you can get that information. Explicit and implicit invocation is a horrible way of phrasing this, but um, fairly simple. An explicit invocation is generally where you would include the name of the skill or action. So it would be Alexa, Open Coffee Wizard, or OK Google, Talk to Coffee Wizard. An implicit invocation is where you don't actively mention the name. And what happens is then the, uh, the device themselves kind of will then try and match a skill or action to it. So in that case, it might be Alexa, recommend the coffee for a sunny day. Alexa would then go through all of the different skills, again, in, in sort of in split seconds, and then try and find a skill that matched that. Um, so as I mentioned, discoverability, it's not always appropriate to use explicit intents as it can feel less conversational and a little bit stilted and mechanistic. Um, so Alexa has a system called HitRank. And it's a neural network um, that's fairly sophisticated and it ranks skills using natural language. Um, so let's have a look at this. So this is an example from uh, the Amazon use themselves. So if somebody says to the Alexa device, play Michael Jackson, what it will do on the top line, it will start to shortlist and it will start to put things into uh, categories and establish contexts. So it will say, oh, it's classic music and it's pop music. Now it's nothing to do with the weather. Uh, it could be a video. Uh, it's not a smart home. Uh, device. So again, it can shortlist. And then from the shortlist, it will look at intents and it will look at um, also slots as well in some cases. So it will say, let's say classic music. So it could play, play that tune or it might be pop music and it's identified the singer as Michael Jackson. It could be a video. It could be him playing live or it could be a uh, moonwalking, Billie Jean, something like that, or Thriller. And again, it will establish the actor as Michael Jackson. Then it will look through contextual signals. So it will look at things like popularity, uh, usage patterns of the person making the request, and it will use this hypothesis re-ranking order. And then from there, it will establish a rank. So in this case, it said pop music is probably the most likely thing the person wants to listen to rather than watch a video. And then it will obviously just play a track by Michael Jack Jackson. Um, so let's take a little pause here and look at a few stats about the voice technology industry as a whole. Um, it's predicted to be worth just over half a billion dollars by 2019, so it's a, a small but growing uh, market. Um, there's over 21 million smart speakers predicted to be in the US by 2020, so again, fairly high numbers. Um, Google Assistant, crucially, is now available to over 95% of Android devices and the majority of iOS. So to access some of these services, whether it's Alexa or Google, you don't necessarily need to own a smart speaker or specific hardware, you can install and download an app, and then that will basically allow you to, uh, to have that still uh, that level of functionality. Um, so in terms of creating skills and actions, well, Google and uh, Amazon both provide developer-friendly tools. So that is uh, Amazon Web Services with, with Lambda, and Lambda is a really interesting um, serverless architecture that allows you to basically serve scripts, and you're only charged for the compute units that you um, that uh, are used. So if you've got a, a skill that doesn't have a huge amount of traffic, you will be in the free tier. Obviously, if you've got a skill that's uh, 50,000 people a day are interacting with, then it will work on a sliding scale. Google have a system called Dialogflow, 
um, which is, is fairly similar, and they use Firebase and Google Cloud as their back end. Um, both of the platforms can work with a variety of languages, so these can be Node.js, JavaScript, Java, uh, Python, Go, etc. So they are fairly um, platform agnostic and fairly flexible, so for developers, um, plenty of different options to go out there. Um, you can also use SSML, which is Speech Synthesis Markup Language, and this can be used to control the pronunciation, speed and pitch of phrases. So for example, you may, you may want to make uh, Alexa pause, whisper, or place emphasis on specific words. So it can be quite a useful uh, tool that's, that you can have at your disposal. Analytics, um, both platforms have really detailed performance measurement tools, so you can monitor usage and find out how people are interacting with the skills and actions. Here's a, a small sample of some uh, analytics from Amazon Alexa. So we can see things like how many people are interacting with it. We can also split down the intent. So where we've got what are called multimodal skills, which are basically where they branch off in a, like in a conversational style, we can look at the stats in more detail and see how people are engaging with that. Um, likewise with uh, Google Home, this is pre um, presented in a fairly familiar interface. If you've ever used Google Analytics, it's a similar kind of thing. So you can see things like usage patterns, uh, feedback, uh, any kind of error reports and duration and things like that. Um, and here's a couple of uh, interesting stats. So this is from Q1 of uh, 2017. And we can see at that point, Amazon were absolutely dominating the market globally. Um, Google were just under 20% with their devices and 1.1% with the others. If we move forward to Q1 of this year, we see a bit of a shift taking place. Amazon has still got a very, very large percentage of the, of the, um, of the pie chart, uh, but Google have really caught up. They've, they've re released the device, um, um, Google Home devices, and they are actually catching up. 17.3% are others, so that includes things like the um, Apple HomePod, and uh, also we've seen the emergence of um, players from China as well. So we've seen Alibaba on nearly 12% and Xiaomi on 7%. So nearly 20% of the market is, the, uh, is, is, is now uh, Chinese. And we would expect that to probably uh, grow as time moves on. Um, interestingly, Amazon is still the uh, by far the dominant player in the States and have around about 70% of the market. So if you are aiming at an international market, then uh, you definitely need to be considering Alexa um, although I would suggest, um, wherever possible, developing uh, for both uh, the uh, Amazon Alexa and Google Home platform. Um, if you were ever in any doubt about Amazon's um, commitment to Alexa, uh, this quote from Jeff Bezos, their uh, CEO, uh, a recent uh, shareholder earnings call, uh, is fairly clear. So he stated, um, our 2017 predictions for Alexa were very optimistic and we far exceeded them. We don't see positive surprise to this magnitude very often, expect us to double down. So that's really a statement of intent, expect to see uh, Alexa everywhere. Um, so we've looked at the positives, we've looked at the use cases, we've looked at the technology. Let's um, cover off a few barriers to adoption. So social inhibitions, we're often terribly English, we don't like speaking in public, we don't like making a scene. It can sometimes be slightly awkward to speak to these devices. Um, that could be a generational thing, there's not enough research at this stage um, and we may become more comfortable talking to AI um, and smart speakers as time goes on but that's kind of an interesting one to think about. Uh, trust. Trust and safety, these are really critical. Um, lots of people are kind of slightly uh, concerned about devices that could potentially listen into all our conversations and then share that data with third parties. Uh, the more paranoid you think all their information is being shared with the CIA, NSA, various different intelligence agencies. And whilst it's true that devices are in passive listening mode, the actual logistics of storing every individual conversation would be just mind-boggling. There's no server capacity on Earth that could handle that amount of data. Um, so um, whilst it is uh, sensible to be cautious and to take appropriate safety precautions, um, it is probably uh, not something you need to worry about um, a huge amount. Um, although obviously if you have uh, children, it's worth considering parental controls and applying those as well, obviously. Um, awareness. Um, sometimes it's difficult in terms of people have the devices, it might, be, it might own a, um, a Google Home or an Amazon Alexa device and they literally just play music and there's an egg timer and that's fine but 
um, they do so much more. So it's raising that awareness, making people aware that there's skills and actions out there that can really kind of augment um, and exploit the full power of these, uh, these devices. So um, this also brings us into this concept of ambient computing or sometimes called ubiquitous computing. And this is where the physical interface becomes less vital. Um, so we'll use things like cloud services and we'll connect to the internet but we won't necessarily need a physical interface, so it won't be a, a desktop or a laptop, it won't be a mobile phone, but the network is still there. And obviously things like 5G rollout, smart cities, that's really going to help um, focus things and push things forward because we'll have um, much, much faster and much more reliable networks everywhere, um, and that will really help. And we could almost see that we're entering a, different, a new era. So we've gone through the, uh, the era of the kind of 80s, 90s, that was a desktop era, so we had these kind of ugly beige boxes that got the job done, but computers were very kind of physically based, um, you could have the occasional laptop, but everything was done on these large boxes. And then we moved into the mobile era, uh, mobiles and tablets, touchscreens, um, doing things in a, you know, where we wanted, when we wanted, and now we're probably moving more into the voice era. Uh, which allows us to still access the same range of services, have that functionality, but in a more intuitive way. Now, it's important to say that um, the voice era doesn't uh, replace the desktop or mobile era. There's always going to be a place for desktops and workstations, likewise for mobiles. It's not replacing them, but it is another channel. It's another thing that we need to consider. Um, so we've looked at all the different use cases of technology, some of the problems and some of the, uh, some of the opportunities, but why should we use it? Well, this is a really important one. There's no barriers to entry. As long as we can speak, we can use the devices. Uh, we don't have to learn an interface or any kind of technology, and it will just work. Um, there's no learning curve. As I just mentioned, we don't need to um, understand um, you know, how things work. We can just speak in an intuitive way, and devices will understand. And it's cost-effective. Um, it is relatively cheap and straightforward for um, developers to uh, contact providers to, to roll these services out and update them. There's no big investment in, uh, in financial, financial investment needed um, and it can be quite cost effective. Uh, the quick and flexible, we all live very busy lives, we're all running around uh, here, there and everywhere. So being able to get quick, accurate information uh, just by using your voice is really, really helpful. And it serves a global community. This is really important. Uh, when you build um, skills for Alexa and Google Home Actions, you can automatically have that content translated into different languages. There's emerging markets all the time. Uh, Alexa recently launched in uh, territories such as Japan and India and uh, also uh, Europe as well. So again, being able to, to get your content, get your messages out to a global community is really critical. Um, and uh, importantly, it creates a point of difference. So the truly innovative, the truly uh, cutting edge brands will embrace voice, will have a strategy for it. Just as the more tech savvy uh, companies embrace mobile early in the adoption cycle and sort of benefits, the people who will uh, understand voice and get behind it, they will have a point of difference and that will differentiate them in a very crowded market. Um, so who's, who's using it well? Well, the BBC, they tend to be at the forefront of technology. Um, they're doing some really interesting stuff with narrative and also with their news content. Netflix, as I mentioned previously, they're doing some very interesting things, extending the characters from their shows and uh, using it as a, um, an audio uh, narrative. Um, Ocado um, is just one retailer who uh, allows you to do things like order your online shopping in a very intuitive way. Um, and HNRC doing some very interesting stuff with tax credits. So we're having and sending people off to websites of impenetrably long forms that are very difficult to understand. They can speak to a device and find out uh, what tax credits are, are due to them and what, know, where, what, how they can uh, access those. Um, so here's some final tips in terms of best practice for, for designing for, for voice. So, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, first of all, find your niche. This is like any kind of... Uh, IT projects. It's really understanding your audience, understanding problems and uh, offering a solution. Now this was quite an interesting experiment. Um, last Halloween I built this uh, uh, um, Google Home action called Scary Movies 
And uh, it was just an experiment. It was built over uh, a couple of days. And it was a, a conversational um, voice agent that basically people could give people recommendations based on the answers to a couple of questions in terms of uh, suggesting a few scary movies for Halloween. And uh, when this was, this was launched, there was no publicity around it at all. But because there was a, not a huge amount of content on the, uh, the Google Home directory at that time, it actually took off quite well. And in terms of placement, it was placed next, next to Netflix, which was fantastic. <laughs> and um, as a result, it still gets around about 3,500 unique visitors and users every month and, uh, and high ratings. So it's definitely worth considering launching um, a niche skill, uh, because let's face it, this is fairly niche. Horror fans are, are a niche audience. Uh, but it's worth considering launching that um, on, uh, on Alexa and uh, home because you will generally find people who are passionate about things and interested in, uh, in what you're offering. Um, be helpful, this sounds really obvious, but what we want to avoid uh, the uh, any kind of sort of closed doors so um, and uh, and also you want to give as much guidance as possible uh, when people are, are interacting with your skills. So here's an example. So this this first example is fairly pro problematic. So for instance, if your opening um, statement is "Hi, I am a coffee wizard. Do you have a question for me?" This is far too ambiguous. It's too open ended. Somebody could ask you everything from "What's the meaning of life?" It's 42, by the way. Um, or it could be, uh, do you believe in God? And it's not anything to do with Coffee Wizard. It's not anything to do with this skill or the action. Um, so instead, what you should probably do is um, give people a clear set of choices or options. Uh, give them agency within a set of parameters. So instead, something like, hi, I'm a Coffee Wizard. To begin, do you prefer sweet or savoury flavours? This is much more helpful because it gives people a sense of what, what's expected of them, but it also gives them some kind of parameters and some agency within that. Um, avoid conversational cul-de-sacs. Just so you might have boring conversations with people and we try and get away from them, uh, avoid that with voice. So if, for instance, there's an issue and uh, the voice agent can't understand what someone said, um, try and be as helpful as possible and say, you know, it's not you, it's me. Uh, how can I help? Um, if you want to start over, just say start over. If you want some help, just say help. And just give people some options. So avoid um, shutting people down on that. Um, this is really important, but respect privacy. So never ask for personal data um, without any kind of justification uh, and avoid it wherever possible. So it's fine to ask people questions, but anything that could be uh, construed as a uh, any kind of um, personal data needs to be really carefully considered. Obviously, there's GDPR in place. Uh, in fairness, um, both uh, Amazon and Google are very, uh, very respectful of this. And uh, when you actually send a skill or an action to be certified, um, you will actually have to have a, a fully valid privacy notice and a policy um, explaining exactly how that data is being used. Likewise, be ethical. Always be ethical. Um, don't abuse data. If people are giving you information, uh, treat it with respect and don't use it for any false purposes. Uh, embrace small talk. This is really important. Um, as you are speaking to a machine, you want the conversation to be as natural as possible and as human as possible and people to be able to uh, to uh, feel that they're being connected with. So adding in occasional bits of small talk, that mm's, ah's, the uh, I'm not quite so sure, that really helps. And in fact, there's quite a lot of research being done at the moment, uh, again at MIT and various other places where they are actually uh, making, uh, building AI that will create small errors occasionally, just so it becomes more human, so people can relate to it more, more uh, readily. What you want to avoid is the kind of HAL 9000 approach from 2001 of, I'm afraid I can't let you do that, Dave, but rather, you know, I'd really want to help you, Dave. And finally, personality goes a long way. So we all want to have a fun conversation when we speak to people. We don't want to have a bland, boring conversation. So again, imbue uh, any kind of skills, any, any actions that you create, give them some personality and uh, that really helps. It really helps people empathise with that. So uh, thank you very much for listening. I hope you found this session helpful. Uh, please feel free to visit .kumo.com to learn more. And uh, I uh, I'll thank you very much for listening.